everyone and welcome to the European Teams User Group October meeting. And today uh, with me there are, of course, Adam and Chris Hort. And uh, hopefully Chris Webb will join up later, uh, later during the day. And there, of course, you can see our Twitter handle and the hashtag we are using uh, in our meetings. But I don't want to dwell on this slide too much. My name is Vesku Nopanen and I'm going to be just kind of going through a few slides before we are letting our stars of the day to kind of open wide and, and let them speak and, and uh, start the presentations. But what is the Your Teams UG? Uh, this was all about creating a network of professionals. Uh, we were uh, met at the community and, and in the early days of this uh, Euroteams user group meetings. So basically, Chris Hoard Adam, and Adam Delginger found, out, found this team up. And later on, uh, that was added by me and Chris Webb. And together, we have quite an impact on the show shop because there's something like 8K followers or, or uh, people who are seeing our posts. And, and so our network spans quite a, quite a big amount of people there. And so far over these 18 plus months, uh, we've had almost 40 speakers already. So which is a, a very nice figure uh, of its own. But uh, what we want to do with this European Teams user group is to have this opportunity to speak and, and to have a kind of a, uh, I don't know, I don't want to call it a training, but you have a kind of a very easy step forward on speaking and presenting and, and and kind of are making way to the bigger conferences later. But also we have great uh, presenters who have been seasoned uh, throughout in many years in those uh, uh, big sessions or big, uh, big uh, events. So it's great to have them here and so you have a kind of mix and match of a uh, very deep knowledge and of course new people who are, who are being introduced to, to this scene. So we try our best to democratize the team's knowledge and experience yeah, and to democratize is a hard word for me, so I can see Adam laughing out there. <clears throat> but hey, uh, and if you want to speak uh, in our user group meetings, uh, feel free to uh, go to the euroteamsug.com slash CFS URL and apply in. Uh, so you are feel, feel free to kind of, uh, uh, if you have a session topic in your mind, just put the short description there and let us know what you would like to speak and share about. So this is all about community sharing and caring and, and just uh, letting people know what's what's happening with teams and getting out experiences and ideas there. And of course, kind of, uh, we just had a, uh, our Teams Fest a couple of weeks ago. And uh, at this point, of course, uh, Chris, do you want to share some ideas? How, how the day went? How did you like it? Yeah, well, it was a fantastic day. It was uh, five months, I think, in the planning to get that uh, that day uh, underway, and uh, the results were very successful, as you can see uh, from the metrics. We we love to be kind of open and transparent, and 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 and, and show you both uh, you know the, the the good points and the bad points. We had over one thousand three hundred unique attendees on the day. Uh, we had roughly somewhere between. Uh, 90 and 95 speakers. We had 85 sessions. The overall attend event rating was 4.7 out of 5, and, and what we call a net promoter score was around about 80%, which for anyone who, who's involved in doing events is absolutely amazing. That What that means is, is, is that roughly between eight and nine people out of 10 would not only recommend, but return if, uh, if we did an event again. If you uh, and the metrics on social, uh, because there was a lot of uh, tweets and LinkedIn posts going out around that time. For Teams Fest, there was over 3.5 million uh, impressions on Twitter, reaching almost a million people. So that's absolutely phenomenal numbers. Now, the Teams Fest that we did, that we've recently done, was much bigger uh, than the ones that we did before. So when we started out, the event was, uh, I would say, roughly... 30 speakers and, and roughly 600 people. Uh, the, the one, the second one that we did was kind of 50 speakers and again, six to 800. So this one was much, much bigger. And the thing that I think, because I'll, I'll pass over to Adam, is just how 
much people enjoyed the day. We tried to make it easy for people to join, easy for people to consume con uh, their, their content, uh, and really just to, to make the whole experience very easy. We've attended events throughout the course of this year, through the summer, uh, in this virtual situation. And, and a lot of it is kind of feels a bit clunky. We have to have separate logins and IDs to be able to access tenants, to access the resources. We tried to make it very clean, very like one click join. So I think that that is what I, I personally liked best. And, and, and I think because we did that, we, we, we got the good feedback. Adam, how about you? Fantastic day, awesome day. Um, couldn't be happier. Or, I mean, you can always be happy, right? But enough happy. Um, I mean, uh, we had so much uh, people uh, telling us and, and my, to me their impressions about the day. And it was, as Chris mentioned, I mean, uh, it was worked seamlessly. It was re really easy to you know, just let get started, you know. Um, no, you have to, no, you know, tricks behind the scenes. You have to uh, move around or, or switch tenants or anything like that. It was very easy and the content was awesome, was the impressions overall. I mean, I've heard several, and I think we all did on, on Twitter as well, but I actually heard this uh, just, was it today or yesterday? Like, I mean, it was better than Ignite. I mean, I don't, we don't compare ourselves to Ignite, but it's really like a good thing to, to hear. And that kind of means like we did something right. So overall, uh, really happy. Uh, um, no technical issues either. I mean, everything went really smooth and uh, yeah. Yeah, it was a great day. Uh, you about, uh, I was about to say that uh, that feedback as well, that it was better than the Ignite. And it uh, it's a kind of a very highest level compliment we can get, I, I, I think. Because that yeah. tells about the how, how we managed to set it up, how, how we did the registration part, but also how did the audience feel about it. And the feel is very important on these community events. That's what we love. We, we love the community and, and and that's the kind of the key things that uh, they said that they had a really good feel about Teams Fest and, and how how people were able to interact and, and the launch was also used. That was a great kind of add on we didn't had earlier. And just before we move on to you know our speakers, uh, I've had a lot of people that have that have asked me, and I, I know the guys have as well, as to whether we'll be doing this in in again in 2021. And the answer for that is absolutely, we will absolutely be going again. Um, however, we will be taking a little bit of time to ever think about that. We'll have a look at, um, and we, we we generally have meetings after uh, these events for a couple of weeks after where we kind of analyze the feedback, what is it we could do better, what kind of things that, that people want to see in such an event so that we can pipe that into the next one. I mean, when we started out, it, it, it was it was literally, like I say, it was 30 speakers. It, it was, we didn't even know how to, to probably run an event at scale. It's something we've learned over the course of doing this many, many times, and we're still learning things. So there's many lessons, as it were, to be learned and how we can make people feel even more included than they were. How best can we work with speakers? What about the technology that, that kind of works best for what we're trying to achieve? So just to say, yes, we will definitely be back. We'll we'll probably take a, you know, be taking it easy over the course of the next few months, enjoy Christmas, and then we'll think about going again. So having a look at uh, our Twitter posts and, and, and our blogs, because there, there will definitely be more coming out over the course of the next few months. And just to come back to kind of sadness, you can go ahead and check out the recordings. The systems recordings are available at teamsfest.prox uh, slash 2020 and the decks are available as well and at the teamsfest.prox uh, slash decks. We tried to make those easy as well. We had a few kind of the domains here, here and there about the finding out the, what would work best uh, for the audience as well. But all right, today the stars are the uh, speakers, our guests today, who are uh, Bill Meyer and Khalid Hussain. And uh, first we will be hearing uh, uh, from Bill about uh, major pitfalls when building a large scale Microsoft Teams app on Azure. So I give a kind of a hint that it's about sales team and, and its foundation. Probably he's still nodding. <laughs> so, so he's agreeing what I'm, I'm saying. 
and uh, and the second part uh, the second session is about security and governance in teams but at this point i think i just give this stage over to bill and uh, we, i had the pleasure of meeting him in person in, in the, what was that two and a half years ago at the mvp summit at seattle and it was yeah it was it was great meeting you there and and uh, of course learning your nickname because it's it's making things a lot easier for me <laughs> on the pronunciation wise but hey bill please uh, go ahead and take over the stage thanks for um gonna just share my screen so um first of all um I want to congratulate all the team for the latest team fest that was really um, a, a great event and that that was really amazing um, i'm impatient to uh, attend the next one so um, i'm guillaume Meyer. i'm from paris living right now in los angeles and um, i'm the founder of sales team which is the microsoft teams app uh, that helps um, customers from various size manage the, all the governance aspects of microsoft teams uh, this session is about is really a, a feedback from the trenches. Uh, it, I'm going to try in the next minute to summarize the major pitfalls and and the the key issues we faced while moving from the first prototype, the first proof of concept of the application, to where we are today, meaning two years later and um, having a lot of production customer now. So yeah, that's a, a real world feedback. Um, first of all, um, I'm going to introduce you just in one minute to what is sales team exactly so that you can see what and, and you can start to envision one kind of issues uh, and problems faced during the, the development process. So the, the sales team platform basically in just two slides, um, it gives to end user the capability to create Microsoft Teams from templates uh, in a very easily, easy and secure manner. And these templates are based on a corporate catalog that could be managed by business users. So it means that IT Pro can really delegate the management of templates to uh, uh, yeah, users from the different departments um, in the company. And IT Pro can also attach governance and security policies to templates. Uh, especially, they can define um, at the template level some naming conventions, manage the approval of new teams. So we have an, an embedded approval workflow. They can automatically apply some security policies and target the right template to the right person in the, the company. That's really uh, the four key. Um, policies that you can apply in templates. Uh, and all this platform that I just described in a few words is available as an API, which makes it um, a very interesting platform for uh, consultants, MVPs, and so on that want to build advanced business process based on Microsoft Teams templates for their own customers. So from a logical point of view, um, you have the Microsoft Teams platform and we're sitting on top of it with the different capabilities, catalog of templates, provisioning engine, governance, and so on. And um, we are now adding this API layer, and basically it brings a lot of new interesting capability to integrate third-party apps uh, with Microsoft Teams without any code. So that's really powerful. So for instance, uh, you can integrate your CRM, your HR system, um, using Power Apps Connector or using your custom line of business app. So that's, um, as you can see, you kind of build this kind of platform in, in just a few months. Uh, we're working on this for almost three years now. So as you can imagine, we grow and we start from um, something very small, the first uh, MVP, the first prototype, and uh, we build uh, a, now a large scale uh, Azure platform to and to manage all these services and components. So I'm going to describe the key issues that we face during this growth. So um, the different scaling factors, what are they? Um, so first of all, you will hopefully um, have more and more customers, meaning more users, uh, maybe customers that are bigger 
and the usage, maybe you have new new usage that will drive um, uh, consumption and, and impact your architecture. Um, second, you may have some, fine, some quite often it's neglected. neglected. Um, you will have to support multiple languages. We now have customers in something like 20 different countries, so we have to support million languages and it has an impact. Um, you get new features. Hmm. It happens, you have production customers and you have to add new features in, in, in the meantime. Then you have to, as you're going to maybe bigger and bigger customers, you will have to handle data residency, meaning a customer in Germany will tell you, oh, I, wanna, uh, I want that the data managed by sales team, for instance, uh, I want them stored in Germany, in the Azure data center in Germany. Next, uh, as you're moving forward, you will um, come, become more and more mature in your development process. So you will have to handle multiple environments. So you have one app, but it really has to run in multiple environments. And then you get the compliance issue, meaning how you're controlling security. Um, you will have to meet new compliance when you are working with larger and larger companies. So that that's the key factors for us um, that uh, drives us to implement um, new features. So I'm going to talk about DevOps. Uh, I'm going to start with that. And first of all, I'm going to describe quickly the different technologies that we're using. Um, so from a network perspective, we're using the Azure Front Door service, which is amazing. And basically Front Door managed all the load balancing, SLA, redirection, and so on, really at the um, um, at, at the HTTP layer level. And we have also, of course, some firewalls and technology um, components. Then we have the main application platform. Uh, so our application, it's comprised of different services, API, jobs, processing, and so on. And we have our data platform. And the data platform, we're using three different storage, PostgreSQL, Cosmos DB, Blob Storage, and we're using Redis Cache for performance optimization. So that's basically the horizontal layer. Um, the application platform is built mostly on Node.js, uh, and we're using um, GitHub Actions for all the CI CD process. And we're using a lot of different Azure uh, services for support. Could be just DNS, uh, Azure Active Directory, and also a lot of components to manage the application at scale. Um, when you're uh, in development, it's quite easy to debug and understand what's happening on your on your desktop. But when you're running multiple instances of your application in multiple Azure regions at the same time, well, you need tools to manage all of this. So that's what I'm going to describe in the next few slides. So I'm going to talk about the environment. Um, it's really um, uh, a key aspect of our architecture. So first of all, as you can see, we have, I'm only describing right here only two regions. We have, uh, we're using the French region and North America. And we also have regions in uh, Latin America, Italy and Germany. Each of these Azure regions has to support different environments. So we have an integration environment for developers, UAT uh, acceptance tests for the product managers, pre-production uh, to um, ensure that everything was perfectly, and then the production. So as you can, uh, if you go back to the previous slide, you can basically take it and multiply it by the number of regions we have and the number of environments we have. So it really starts to grow quickly, quickly, quickly. Um, so it, it, it generating a lot of complexities. To manage these different environments, um, we rely intensively on GitHub. So basically we have different branch of development that are corresponding to the different environments. We have the main one for integration and development, integration for the whole development team, the acceptance test, pre-production, and production. Um, I'm using the word ring here for people that are working uh, on Microsoft 365. 
um, it should resonate uh, as it's really the same kind of nomenclature. So of course, we're not as big as Microsoft, but we're trying to learn from the best and, and applying the same kind of principles uh, in separations of concern and in or environment management. How are we deploying code to these different environments? Well, again, it, on, it rely on GitHub and especially GitHub Actions. GitHub Actions is really the foundation for us to automate all the build test deployments in all different environments. And basically, we have different a lot of GitHub Action scripts that are automatically deploying new versions of the application in different regions and in different environments. Um, as you can imagine, you cannot have so many environments and regions to manage and, and do that manually. So um, we had to build a lot of different scripts for that. Um, something that is really related to Microsoft Teams now. Um, in Microsoft Teams, um, as you know, <clears throat> an application is built using a package. This concept of package uh, is really powerful, but it has a lot of limitations. Um, especially, uh, you cannot, um, uh, you must have multiple packages for different environments, uh, especially for the non-production environment. So, as you can see on the left, uh, it's just an example, but uh, you can see that we have something like 20 different versions of the application package. Uh, we have some specific package for specific environment, some specific package for specific regions. Um, and um, so it, it, it starts to be really complex just to manage these manifest files. Um, and the problem was that uh, it was really complex for us to test all of this. So um, just as a trick for people that want to automate the deployment of their package to Microsoft Teams, uh, you can automatically publish an app to your organization app catalog. Um, I just put here the, the reference. Uh, it's from Microsoft Graph. So basically, you can do that using PowerShell or, or any kind of scripting language you want. But um, uh, as a DevOps practice, it's really interesting to be able to, in just one click, build all your different package for your different versions and deploy them automatically to your testing environment. So we um, really automated all this process for deployment and testing. Um, it took us some time to figure out what was the right way to do that, but um, it's getting better and better, and um, Microsoft has just released new endpoints for the Microsoft Graph to uh, better manage the life cycle of your applications. You can refer to the Microsoft Online documentation. Okay, so um, now I'm going to talk about monitoring. Um, as I said, we have customers in a lot of different countries, across time zones, and uh, across environments. So we had to build a system to understand what's happening, what's happening live, and um, how can we investigate when we have an issue. Could be a performance issue, a security issue, uh, a bug. Uh, and uh, so we built the right infrastructure to, to do that. I don't say it's perfect, but at least uh, it started to uh, be uh, quite efficient. So again, I'm going back to uh, it's basically a summary of what I previously showed you with the different components of the application and the data layer. What are we doing to monitor the service? First of all, oops, first of all, uh, we're using Application Insight. That's a key component in Azure. It's super powerful. It's super cheap, and uh, basically um, everything that is related to our application itself uh, is logged tracked and monitored by Application Insight. It will also give you a lot of uh, interesting tools and capabilities to diagnose issues and, and so on. I'm going to show you an example later. Uh, later. Then we're using Azure Defender. Azure Defender on the other side is monitoring the infrastructure itself. Basically, it will look at all these different components and see if the configuration has been done properly if there is no uh, security issue, 
or if you're respecting best practices, or if you comply with a specific um, regulatory constraint. So it so it's the opposite side. On, on the top, I'm monitoring the application. On bottom, I'm monitoring the infrastructure. So it's two different two different components. So we had at some point to merge all of this information. And that's where it comes from Azure Sentinel. Um, it's quite a recent service on Azure. Uh, Azure Sentinel is a platform to basically aggregate everything in terms of log alerts. Uh, and, and it will give you a lot of tools to manage and process all this information. So I'm going to give you uh, an example of um, all these services. So I'm going to start with Application Insight. Uh, application Insight is really about the application itself. And for instance, uh, on this screenshot, you can see a live user a representation of the user flow, meaning uh, users are starting with this page and they mostly navigate to this one. And so you can have a lot of different uh, insights about how your users are using the application. And you also have a lot of tools to diagnose code issues. Uh, that's really, really powerful. Um, that's the first thing you should do <laughs> uh, when developing a new app on, on Azure. Then you have Azure Sentinel. So Azure Sentinel is really collecting all the log diagnostics uh, information from all our different services. So as you can see here, by the way, it's um, real world data. Um, for the last 24 hour, it collected something like 6 million um, logs uh, and entries. So mostly from the application itself, but also from the different Azure components and Azure configuration. That's really powerful because it means that you now have one single point to manage all your events and alerts. How do you create and manage your alerts in Azure Sentinel? Well, you it's based on rules. And um, again, that's a, um, an example of um, something like, yeah, 10 rules here um, that will basically monitor all these logs and diagnostic files and generate alerts uh, when it's required. These rules are pre-made and uh, provided by Microsoft and third-party security companies. And you can also build your own alerts and, and create your own rules. So that's really, really powerful. Uh, it's also in, in important for us um, because we are in a certification process and it's a requirement for us now to have all these logs centralized, analyzed, and, and um, for us being able to generate automated alerts on, on logs. And when you have to investigate uh, an issue or a specific alert, you can really delve into the logs. And, and, and again, that's a, a real world example. Um, and uh, you can see here that you have access to all the logs from <clears throat> all the services you are using across your regions, across your services. So that's really, really, really powerful. OK, um, so I talk about the DevOps process and the monitoring aspect. So I'm going to move to the, the last one, which is um, maybe I'm going to delve into the details of the Microsoft Graph and what we've learned for the past two years uh, when building this now large scale um, application. So what is the Microsoft Graph? Um, theoretically speaking, it's one API to access all the underlying Microsoft Cloud services, uh, especially Microsoft 365, but, but it's, uh, it gives you access to a lot of different online services from Microsoft. So the promise is quite interesting and, and it's super promising and it's really, really powerful. The problem with the Microsoft Graph, when we, you start to have an application with a lot of requests, a lot of users, is that it may be unstable, it may be unreliable, and my advice is never blindly. Uh, I'm going to delve into the details and give you some examples, and it will uh, close my uh, session. So uh, it's sometimes unstable. So of course, if you're doing just uh, a prototype, maybe you won't see this kind of errors. But as you're moving to production and you start to have 
customers across data centers and so on, um, you will see some sometimes random errors. Basically, sometimes it's just a network routing, uh, routing issue. You will never know. But uh, what, we, what we have from our statistics, uh, when we're doing large scale transactions, meaning transaction that imp involve a lot of requests to the Microsoft Graph, we have something like 10% of them that have at least one unexpected graph error. So it's really something that we had to learn to cope with and to handle them properly and to manage that. Um, second, you may find sometimes that the documentation itself that is unstable. You may sometimes find different informations at different places, even on Microsoft websites. Uh, there's a lot of examples about that. And it's even worse for the samples. So uh, be careful to, and double check what you can find on the documentation website and especially from the samples. Sometimes it's unreliable and it's even worse. Uh, so you have inconsistencies uh, across endpoints, uh, but again, that's something you can cope with uh, quite easily. The real problem is, and the most important is the last one. It's called false positive. Sometimes the graph would say, oh, you asked me to, let's say, create a new team or let's say create a new private channel. It's okay, it's done. And then you check, and in fact, it's not. So, uh, and, and it happens, um, I don't have any statistics about that, but it happens, it happens sometimes. So again, if you're managing your environment, you get to take care uh, of it. And uh, it happens, especially for the late, the endpoints that were released the most recently. So my final advice uh, on the Microsoft Graph is, um, that's the, the pseudocode that we're using for any call to the Microsoft Graph. Um, so first of all, we are applying a limiter to prevent throttling. Uh, as you know, you cannot call a million times per second the Microsoft Graph. You get to schedule calls and, and so on. So you're applying what we call a limiter to do that. Second, you're calling the graph. And if the graph say that it's OK, make another call to verify that it's really OK. And I'm going to just give you an example as a conclusion. Um, let's say you create a new team using the Microsoft Graph and um, you want to you, you use, you add a custom tab. Just after the creation of the team, my advice, just check if you can read the list of channels, for instance. So every single time you're creating something in Teams, make a second call to check that it has really been created, for instance, or that the underlying artifacts are really uh, available. So here it is. Um, thanks a lot. I hope you, you find this interesting. Maybe we can take some, some questions. I don't know if I still have time. Yeah, probably. I kept some minutes to, uh, to take some questions. Uh, thank you, Bill. And of course, yes, questions are Welcome. And uh, that's kind of the fun thing you, uh, be, you've been struggling with Graph API stuff. I've been using that in my Power Automates oh, uh, yeah. now and then. And, and it's been, there's fun things in there. And, and then there's things like that really don't sometimes make change, uh, like sense. So, for example, what you were saying with the drop out the drive and, and Teams Graph APIs. They are similar, but they are not. Yeah, they are similar, but they are not. And um, as I said, for us, what was the most painful really is this um, uh, false positive, meaning when the graph says, oh, it's OK, it returns a positive uh, code, and you have to double check everything and every single time. It's especially true for the most recent uh, endpoints, such as uh, private channels, for instance. Uh, where we had a lot of issues with, with that. Um, the, the main one, for instance, you're creating a private channel by code, and then you're trying to upload a file to the related SharePoint site. Well, you have to wait for a certain amount of time, but you don't know how much, you don't know what is the minimum or maximum, you don't know how many times you have to retry if it doesn't work. So that's really, really, really painful. So yes. it, it, it creates a lot of complexities in your code. 
Oh yeah, and the, that private uh, channel uh, files, that, that's really, really painful because I've been struggling with that as well and I was under the impression that it's not created uh, yeah. at all uh, until you go ahead and click it and, and I don't know if there's a workaround on that or it's just about waiting. Well, it's waiting and doing some retry and, and you know, that's the Microsoft strategy, it's called plug and pray. So you 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 you, call, you make the call and you pray <laughs> and you wait and you, you know, hopefully maybe sometimes it works. Now seriously, uh, I, I understand why I get a lot of customers that completely stop using uh, Power Automate to do this kind of operations on the Microsoft Graph because of this, because it works yeah. in your demo environment. That's perfect. But as soon as you're moving to production, you cannot diagnose, and doing this kind of um, try catch retry and so on in power automate that's that's really a mess uh, yeah it can be uh, there's a question in the chat about sure. the office graph related to graph api uh, all right i can read it back uh, there's a question about office uh, has the office graph something to do with the microsoft api a uh, graph api or is it just the same name no, uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. Microsoft always had issues with you know naming and branding, but uh, okay. So the Office Graph is a concept and uh, a suite of tools that basically are analyzing all the signals that are happening inside an M two sixty five environment. So what can, um, who are you messaging with? Um, when you're sharing documents with who and so on. And it's collecting all of this data and it's generating some insights. Could be who are your, um, who could be the most interesting contact for you in a specific context, this kind of stuff. Uh, and, and basically all these insights from Office Graph are exposed as endpoints in the Microsoft Graph. So Microsoft Graph is just the technical layer, it's a, it's a REST API. And inside this um, REST API, you get some endpoints to call the Office Graph. But uh, quite, quite frankly, I haven't heard Microsoft really use the word Office Graph recently. And um, mostly Office is disappearing in favor of Microsoft. So I think we will only hear, hear about Microsoft Graph uh, in the next few months in the future yeah i think so too uh okay if there are no more uh, other questions right now you can always ask the questions from bill uh, in the chat of course sure uh oh, there is a okay just when i was about to say we can go forward but um thanks bill for sharing your experiences what the devops and how do you do use it to deploy your solution into different tenants to You're align the data residency uh, can you answer that in the chat? Is that a, uh, all right. Sure, I, I'm going to answer the question in the chat. Thank you. All right, Ex excellent. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Khalid, are you all set yeah. and go, ready to go? Yes. So how much time we have now? 45 minutes? Or? Uh, we've been trying to keep this in a half an hour presentation. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, so we have some time for questions and, and we people don't get bored totally uh, uh, when, when it takes two hours <laughs> for, for the meeting. <clears throat> no, I think I will uh, mostly go to the demos part. I will show some hands on stuff yeah. more and uh, yeah, we will yeah, see. Excellent. Yeah. Feel free to start sharing and, yeah. and uh, take over. Okay. okay, so let me share my screen. So, hello guys, uh, my name is uh, Khaled Hussain and uh, my topic today to speak about uh, Microsoft Teams, security and compliance. My background, uh, I work for Microsoft in last role as a full-time in uh, Dublin office. So I was covering Middle East and Africa region and plus Europe side. So I have a quite, huge experience in customer side. So I will try to share some tips and tricks and uh, knowledge base that how we can onboard teams securely and how we can 
configure it, uh, roll out it into our customer environments. So let's start uh, with talking about Microsoft Teams. You know that Microsoft Teams is a centralized place for chat, for Teams, for calling, for sharing. There is, as in the last session, there is a much more apps and workflows are going on. So uh, Microsoft Teams as going to be a centralized place in a digital workplace because uh, as for my knowledge now Microsoft might be going that way to drive Outlook experience into the teams because now you can build share bring in SharePoint you can bring in chat collaboration calling audio video meeting experience everything is at, at one centralized place so there we have to look in the different directions because of course it's going to be a centralized hub for everything in the organization. Then we have to look on the different aspects like identity and access management, information protection, uh, discover and respond, governance of the data, managing the risks. So there is quite different diverse areas to manage security for teams and the uh for for security and compliance for the teams so i would say let's start with the identity and access management in identity and access management that is actually we have to protect front door before moving any step next in digital workplace because we have to check it that who can access from where which device how they can access what kind of the clients they will use, what will be the locations of the people, how they can access, because it's completely in due to the COVID situation, lots of people working from the home and uh, identity and access management is quite major topic to start it with. So uh, as you now know that Microsoft Teams is strongly use cloud identities either cloud identity or synchronized identity or federated identities so mainly you can say 60 percent people using with synchronized identities and some where entities and some federated identities on the top of multi-factor authentication so you can use uh, lots of methods for uh, authentication inside microsoft teams it's uh, using the same azure active directory control plane and on the top, in terms of the security and conditional access, you can use this. Any device, let's say now Microsoft Teams is available for uh, Linux, for Windows, for Mac, for uh, iOS devices, Android devices. So you have a full choice to manage it, how you can collaborate, how you can securely manage uh, Microsoft Teams inside your environment. So for me, it's very, strong start point is conditional access. So in terms of the conditional access, you have to uh, create a persona that how you wanna do that team's security inside your environment. So let me jump into my whiteboard. So let's say if we have uh, some kind of um, rollout or uh, deployment or uh, usage of the teams, we have to make sure that there is one is uh, all users, Second, you have to take care of the global administrators. Number third is guest users. You have to go through that, that you can secure these parties end-to-end -end, like global administrators, guest users. And number four is, let's say there is a, some special SP, I will say special users, I will say, might be some people you have to exclude them out of the box so i just want to share that i have a some kind of a framework a reference i noted down the best practices there is other colleagues also in the market are doing that so i implemented this uh, uh, conditional access policy so i can just show quickly into my environment so this is my environment in azure active directory and uh, this is a security part and in security I implemented the conditional access. So uh, let's say I can just share the experience that how I am managing uh, Microsoft Teams experience inside my Windows 10 
and how I can uh, allow the access to Microsoft Teams. So for me, I have uh, one device that is uh, totally hybrid ready joined, and uh, this is working, uh, let's say I have it in my Hyper-V environment. So this is one compliant device with my environment. And let's look at how this is my personal device. So I have one compliant, one uh, non-compliant device. So I configure this policy that for Windows 10 access anytime it's done, but I will ask them that must provide multi-factor authentication and the compliance that if you like to access what kind of applications I blocked access with Office 365 that if someone wants to access the Teams, they really need to make sure that their device is compliant or hybrid ready joined. So yeah, I did that. So I tried to log in with my one test user that how it works, what could be the behavior. So I have this user, I logged in with this. It will ask me for multi-factor authentication, and I have to provide that multi-factor authentication in terms of 7544. Yeah, but this device does not meet my compliance requirement, so you can secure your uh, Teams environment access through non-compliant devices in the similar behavior. So just want to show quickly in this area, Let's say if I have a Microsoft Teams, and now uh, this is my another device that is uh, fully compliant. I try to access uh, Teams. Let's say so I'm using this one, this user. And I put the password. So this will ask me for multi-factor authentication. So due to the state of the device, okay, done. Here I go, I can uh, log in using this device. So why it's allow me to sign in using this device? Because I configured the policy that I can access only uh, Microsoft applications are the securely using uh, Microsoft marked as a compliant devices. So that is actually the end user behavior that you can lock down or you can do that also. I just want to show quickly in terms of, uh, let's say if I am a user and I, what could be the experience with the end user devices? Let's say if I bring in my own device, bring your own device. So what could be the experience in that area? So let's say if I have my Teams and if I try to access Microsoft Teams using the from user from this tenant, it will not allow me to access my device because this device is not enrolled in uh, the system actually. Yeah. It will see. So this is actually, okay. Yeah, this one. So I can't access my Microsoft Teams environment because in Microsoft Teams environment on the back end, you are doing the chatting because chat service is uh, taken over by Exchange Online and you have a files, you have a storage for SharePoint, OneDrive. So all kind of the data you are uh, working on that, that data is pretty sensitive and you have to take care of that. It's uh, highly recommended that you have to look at what kind of the devices you want to use, how you want to allow the access to the users. That's important factor to go with that using conditional access. In conditional access, uh, you can design a lot more according to your business requirements. 
and you have to define what kind of applications, devices, how to allow the access, what kind of parameters you want to define. That's really important. And uh, especially, I learned the lesson over uh, years uh, with customers, especially in last two, two, two years, um, as the team's usage is growing more and more, you have to take care of also for the guest users. You must ask them guest users who want to pop it, pop up in into your environment to provide multi-factor authentication because sometimes you don't know they are sitting on the other side of the wall and you don't know they are really the same user might be there is a breach is happening or something like that so must prevent prevent them to access your environment so there is a lot more conditional access are features that you can block them based on the location app protection there is many more in in, in security part so in terms of uh, data loss prevention, uh, when you are working with uh, Microsoft Teams, so there is a different scenario. So right now I got the information that uh, in DLP, you can use sensitivity labels also. And sensitivity labels you can directly apply into the Teams. That's uh, also the doable uh, when you are creating uh, Teams. What is actually the sensitivity labels? Sensitivity labels actually, we can say it's a labeling or classification mechanism with access control. You can apply the rights management on, on your uh, uh, teams. So uh, DLP data loss prevention is working for Microsoft Teams as well. So you can go across the board where your data is running on. So you can manage your chat, your collaboration, your files, everything. Even you can uh, apply those DLP policies or sensitivity levels directly on your uh, uh, teams which you are creating on. So you can block the sensitive uh, information or the content in the real time inside the Microsoft Teams. So I just want to show you about uh, DLP part. Uh, sorry, and sensitivity label part. So let me open my another device. So this is my device. And this is my Teams. So first of all, I have to uh, provide the pin. Yeah, done. And let's say I just want to show you the experience. Let's say I try to create a Teams. So in the Teams, you can see here, you can type the Teams name, and here you can see all sensitivity labels. You can apply directly as backend uh, sensitivity label. Let's say you want to mark it highly confidential, so you can do that. Go, and you want to mark it as a private, done. And here you can type the name of the uh, your team, desired name. Our description you can create that but this team is really secure when you are rolling out in your environment and only the people who are under this uh, template of uh, sensitivity label they can access only with the condition certain conditions no one can access outside of uh, uh, this sensitivity labels your data and your chat and your documentation is fully uh, under that that highly confidential label uh, coverage. So in terms of uh, uh, data discovery, you can uh, seamlessly discover uh, uh, your data inside your environment. And uh, as I saw yesterday that Microsoft is going to roll out also home sites that you can bring in SharePoint experience directly into the teams and you can search in the same bar your data and your SharePoint sites and your pages mainly. So this is uh, actually e-discovery part. You can uh, get this everything in the same method, in the same way. So I just want to share experience again that all your chat is being stored inside Microsoft Teams. Let's say this is uh, my Teams and uh, Sorry, one minute. Yeah. 
So I have to cancel it. And let's say if I go to my files, in my files, in my OneDrive, so I can see my all the chat is stored inside a Microsoft Teams folder. So this is a, the chat files from one shared with me. Uh, data I am sending via chat to the other people. So I just want to share one more quick uh, demo here. Let's say if I copy this uh, message uh, from uh, inside the Teams, and then I try to put it into, let's say, on something my personal area that where it should not be allowed, you can get clear message that your data is compliant and your organization uh, data could not be post pasted here, sorry. So now you can have a better experience, better governance model that your end users, you can minimize end users errors actually overall. And in e-discovery part, you can go and you can uh, search the conversation, what you are doing in the Teams chat history completely in, in under the same umbrella. In terms of the data governance, there is inside Microsoft Teams retention levels set. So I can just show quickly into that. Because in information protection, there is a two, three, the two uh, three parts like information governance that related to retention. And this is information protection that is related to uh, information protection. So it depends upon you that uh, how you want to go with that. You can apply these sensitivity labels you can create as well. Let's say if I create any sensitivity label here, uh, Khalid, and then I copy it the next level done and what kind of files and emails configure encrypt the emails mark them and then here you can configure encryption settings over there so you can apply encryption settings also and you can this is actually a really powerful feature now because many customers ask us that they don't trust microsoft due to compliance reasons due to some data uh, encryption issues so you can bring your own double key encryption on the top in specific groups in specific team workloads that's again another topic to do but still there is uh, many things you can consider in, in in this term okay and let's say this is also auto labeling and here you can uh, set up uh, devices access and privacy settings so you can manage a lot in uh, sensitivity labels and you can apply sensitivity labels also again with uh, automation that's also doable if you like to create uh, automation and you can choose that which label you want to use automatically in terms of uh, your data sensitivity and governance uh, model so in terms of uh, uh, data information governance Inside the information governance, you have, again, it's a structure. You have to implement a full life cycle that how you wanna preserve your data, how you wanna store your data, how you wanna keep, retain your data based on your conditions, based on your business requirements. It's a lot of work needed by from uh, IT security team or IT governance team inside the organization. So you can create uh, sensitivity, sorry, information governance label or retention labels. So then you can apply it using the policies. You can roll out on the specific groups or you can uh, auto apply as well. There is a two direction is, is available into that part. So uh, in terms of uh, managing the risks also, because uh, uh, I get many question that uh, how we can uh, separate. Let's say I'm working with few customers and they ask, okay, we don't want that our end user frontline workers directly reach out to the CEO or CIO of organization. So there is information barriers, ethical walls also available. Uh, so you can define that and you can mark that who can communicate in which segment in HR or financial or 
it depends marketing department so you can define that also to make a better governance model inside your microsoft teams so in meeting segment also so uh, inside uh, audit log this is uh, my uh, last part of uh, the presentation in audit logs now microsoft i will come back on this topic but i just want to show you guys uh, that uh, Microsoft bring in uh, Microsoft Teams logs through Sentinel also. Let's say this is uh, Sentinel and inside the Sentinel. You have uh, Office 365 because it was a big challenge for the customers especially. So Microsoft bring in uh, all logs from Exchange, SharePoint and Teams. It's in the preview. So if we go into the workbook so you can search specific query on uh, team side so you can choose over there from the last 90 days and then you can choose let's say you want to see only microsoft team specific and you want to choose for all activities related to the teams so you can get all the logs all the details inside a microsoft uh, sentinel using um, Mics of uh, graph on the back end. Yeah. And the uh, last part is that uh, the big part for security of uh, Microsoft Teams is uh, Office 365 ATP. That Microsoft covers a lot inside the Microsoft Teams also, because that is a big challenge for the organizations that how to protect if someone is sending the data or copying the data, that is data is malicious and how it's going to be protected. So you can't open the spam links inside your teams and you can get some documents if they are infected. You can enable uh, safe attachments inside uh, Microsoft Teams uh, for Microsoft Teams. How to enable it? We have to go into the protection.office.com and uh, there you can uh, look into threat protection and here is a policy let me check if it's available in this area or it's in uh, governance part no this is not the availability here might be i will go into Not here. ECP. Advanced threat protection. So this is the old uh, panel and you can go for the new experience as well. So from uh, this side and I think there is in the compliance center also or the security center, there is a new option also available. So you can enable this uh, protection of your SharePoint OneDrive and Microsoft Teams uh, using uh, ATP also. So it depends that how much effort you want to put to structure your organizational uh, centralized uh, digital workplace hub so you can protect it and uh, yeah it will help you a lot to uh, deliver security to deliver uh, governance better governance also inside uh, uh, your environment and the last part just then i will finish in two minutes because now we are talking about the teams and teams we are creating the teams we are managing the teams with templates there is a lot of topic going on around the corner but that is very important topic is that how we can set up the life cycle management for a team's governance around because let's say if i am a user of one organization and i created 30 teams and later I'm using just five and 25 teams are just useless for me and for organization as well. But that data is still there. 
you can configure life cycle management for your environment directly and you can put it let's say username and then you can set up for all or might be you can add some selective sites it depends then you have to configure this uh, uh, expiration and uh, uh, sorry life cycle management for your teams because every 30 days before 30 days 15 days and one day system will inform you that uh, please look into your teams these are active teams under your name are you created that and do really want to continue with that or not if not then system will automatically clean up that data so thank you